might be a Viking or a Saxon or a Roman, but tell me, do you like them? Would you sex them? Would you bone them? Would you go to bed with King Ethelred? Would you bunk William the Conk or a romp in the sheets with Samuel Pepys? Mussolini was a meanie, led a fascist insurrection, but does he make you creamy? Does he give you an erection? Would you pork Richard the Duke of York? Does a boner start when you think of Bonaparte? Are you sexually aroused at the thought of Pol Pot? Historical hot or not? Hello and welcome to Historical Hot or Not, the only history podcast that looks at the life and times of history's most celebrated figures and asks, yes, but would you? It's the pod parchment that puts the ass in classical antiquity, the thick in Paleolithic, the nasty in Han Dynasty. I'm your co-host Aidan McCaffrey, I am not a historian, and this is... Uh, Catherine, M- mother. Who's also not a historian. No. But we're comedians, aren't we, Kath? We are, and you know, it's the age-old question, isn't it? Sure, that dictator is a bad person, but... Would you bang him? Exactly. We've all looked at those thirst trap photos of Stalin in his youth and said, I don't care whether he was a low-level gangster or what, he's, he's getting it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd teach him a lesson. Exactly. We've all ranked the six wives of uh, Henry VIII in order of hotness, Cleves being at the top, obviously. <laughs> Who hasn't? I, well, I guess he had to marry them, but we don't have to marry them. We can we just do. objectify them. Yeah, fucking run. Fucking run. We decided it's okay to objectify people who have been dead since at least 1940. I think that's the rule. Yeah. And also, this is um, not sincere. Oh, well, <laughs> speak for yourself. Okay. Um, I, I, mean know... everything I'm, I mean everything I'm about to say for the next hour. <laughs> Fair enough. Bring me my potential suitors. Yes. Oh, well, we should explain what the format is. Yeah, we should totally do <laughs> do that. <laughs> yeah, before we barrel into it. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. Historical hot or not. So in each episode, Kath and I will take it in turns to bring each other, propose to each other a historical figure on a fictional historical dating app we've made up called Etrothed. Uh, and yeah, I'll just say I will explain the life and times of, of a person. And then at the end, Kath will decide whether whether they should bang him or not. And then we'll do the opposite next week. Does that yeah. sound good? Yeah, yeah. I'll bring a lady one next week. Exactly. And, you know, doesn't who knows? It doesn't have to be as heteronormative. We can mix it up down the line. There's, uh, yeah, there's some ladies I'd be interested to propose to you, and I'm sure vice versa. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, Kath, on yeah. what number date is it okay to have sex? 29 BC or 1500 AD? Oh, God. So BC is... A long, longer time ago than yeah. than the other one, isn't it? Right. Like... It doesn't bode well for a history podcast <laughs> that we've kicked this off, and I've thrown some basically root one historical terms at you, BC and AD, and you're already like, which one's which? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> uh, BC but... is before Christ. Okay, uh, I'm going to say AD, Anno Domini. See. Uh, so you do? Oh, you do. That. <laughs> I do. We're not uh, as thick as we make out. Yeah, I go for that one because I feel like they will be more uh, invested in whether I have a nice time or not. Why? Why? How have you come to that conclusion? Because it's less long ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see, I would have gone for twenty nine BC on the grounds that the church, the Catholic Church, in fact, all the Abrahamic religions haven't started yet, have they? <gasps> so they, they they haven't like clamped down their rules on you know what you can put your dick in and how often you can put your dick in and all that. So I kind of feel like twenty nine BC more of a free for all. Yeah, that is a very good point. I had not considered quite clearly. Had not considered. Hey, um, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, there is. I just think twenty nine BC. Get yourself down to your local bacchanalia and participate in a street orgy with no class divisions which is yeah. which is basically my my main kink because i went to pompeii recently. i'm so glad you said pompeii and not a uh, open street orgy then <laughs> and and the open street orgy that they oh, yeah. have, have at pompeii but there's the bath houses there and my god Aiden, oh they were horny motherfuckers <laughs> that, like, I've been the, there. have you yeah. have you seen the pictures on the walls yeah they are my God. And that also, there are so many dicks just carved into everything. What's and the what's the dick to fanny ratio like at the Pompeii Baths? 
Are we talking um, legitimate artwork or are we talking graffiti? <laughs> I think if it's on the wall, it counts. So actual, uh, you know, commissioned paintings, a lot of minge. Um, <laughs> if we're talking about the, the carvature um, into brickwork, by uh by cheeky cheeky scamps uh very much dicks but i think that they are much easier and quicker to draw uh than a detailed uh vulva so <laughs> i if i had to as a feminist if i had to choose genitalia to carve into a wall i would still choose a dick that's an interesting point because it's just it's just a some very basic geometry, the old dick and balls, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Whereas, which is understandable from a very young age. And also a lot of, I suspect a lot of graffiti is done by young men who may yeah. not have had a, a close-up look at the old vagina at that point. Yeah, they're like, what is that? Is that an, an O drawn weird? Is that, yeah. I don't understand. Whereas a dick, it's very instantly recognisable. It's universal. Um, the penis is universal. It is. And I just found it really lovely, actually, to be wandering the streets of an ancient city and just knowing that human nature never changes. Like, if we can draw a dick and balls somewhere, we will. And we'll be able to do it forever. Have you got your e trove dating app ready? I have. I've got it right here. I'm sending you uh, an e trove profile pic. Yeah. This is Tom. He is 52. Mm. And he is from Canterbury. Okay. He's an older man. Yep. Uh, it is a drawing. It's, it's yes. It pre- he predates the photograph. Okay. He does look to have a uh, some kind of dagger. I would say, um, embedded into his skull. Does that work for you? Um, I don't know, like, how much of a problem is it going to be? You know, is is it, am I going to get, if I try and kiss him, am I going to get uh, nicked by it? Is he going to be whinging about it all the time? No one likes a whinger, do they? No, and he, he can't wear a hat either to cover it up. So it's not the hottest thing I've seen, I'll be honest with you, Aidan. His eyes look quite dark. Like he looks like he's had a a hard life. He's he's not a he's not a young fifty two. <laughs> um he do, he he looks back then, troubled. People really looked they wore their age back then, whereas now <laughs> They they did. And I mean, he's got a dagger in his head, so it I, I guess it is. It has been a hard life for him. Now, well, not necessarily. As, as we got to school, his life was okay, but just mm. the very last bit of his life wasn't. <laughs> I'd okay. say last five minutes of his life, bit of a downer. I think that that is true of everyone, though. This photo, it's not a photo, it's a painting. <laughs> In this painting of Tom, he looks mm-hmm. like... You know that sort of uh, fake dagger you could put through your head and it like it goes around the back and it looks like the the plastic sword is going in one end and coming out the other. Yeah. Kind of like Steve Martin, yeah, I'm a wild and crazy guy. If you went mm-hmm. on a date and someone showed up with one of those on, is that a yay or an, is that a yes or or a no for you? <laughs> a fake one. Um we, well I guess are we at a costume party? Would be my first question. Uh, no, because I think, no, because that makes it too easy. I'm talking bar, you've gone on a date, he's shown up, and he's and, he, and he's heard you're a comedian, so he's thought, <laughs> I know what she'll bloody love. Yeah. And then he, he goes into his uh, prop box, and he pulls out his <laughs> the old fake sword through the head hat. Well, I guess I'm already there. Uh, the the <laughs> truth. <laughs> so That's probably... too revealing, Kath. <laughs> If but, I ever set you up on a date and someone <laughs> says, what's this going to be like? I'm going to say, if she's shown up, you are in luck, mate. Oh, God, yeah. That's the method no, way. <laughs> the bar is very low. Um, so, I mean, I guess, again, it would depend if he kept it on the whole time. Uh, I think I'd find that quite unattractive. Uh, or I would really play along with it and take him to A&E. Um, yes. And then wait for six hours until a member of stressed out um medical staff came 
uh, I'd just be screaming and wailing the whole time. Like, you know, you don't understand. <laughs> He's got a knife in his head. Um, Nothing screams romance than uh, wasting <laughs> the time of health professionals in an already besieged and laboured health service. Yeah, particularly because I work at a hospital. So, I, you know, depending on which hospital I went to, I might know some of those staff that I'm fucking over. Yeah. So, uh, in conclusion... No, I don't think it would do it for me. But you know okay. what? It might have a nice personality. Well, let's let, let's let's explore the life. So the person mm-hmm. who the picture is of is actually Thomas Beckett. Do you know much about Thomas Beckett? I've heard of him. Yeah, Thomas Beckett's interesting because it feels like he doesn't feel that totemic. But having delved into his life, he was like absolutely huge uh, in uh, medieval times. He was like this massive Mm. cult figure. Thomas Beckett was born in 1119 or 1120 in Cheapside. Uh, Those facts were probably pieced together later as part of the legend that emerged uh, after his death. And he was born to a merchant and property owner. Uh, He had a decent education at Merton Priory. He spent a year in Paris. That year in Paris screams gap year at me. It does, yeah. And I also love that um, with certain historical historical figures, we don't know when they were born. They have no idea when their birthday was. They're just like, nah, he was born before that now. Because if you were on a date, that's got to be a turn off. If, you, if you're mm. like, when's your birthday? And you said, don't know. And you don't know your birthday. And he's like, I don't know my birthday year because I'm wild. <laughs> I don't know, 11 something or I, it doesn't matter. No, no, it, it does matter though. <laughs> it, like age, at a certain point, age does matter. <laughs> yeah, legally, I'm very much sure it matters. Um, yeah, all of the men who are like, age doesn't matter, I'm like, oh, so you're fucking teenagers then. That's what you're doing, isn't it? Exactly. He set his age range on the dating app to go 15 years younger, but no, no higher than himself. In fact, even mm-hmm. worse, it ends two years before his age, and the yeah. bottom is 15 years below. Mm-hmm. And I think his profile would say stuff like, no kids... No time wasters. No, <laughs> no one who's been married before. No massive yeah. list of wants and nothing that is is going for him. He goes to Paris for a year. That very much feels like a, a gap year. He probably yep. had some awkward sex in hostel bathrooms and then mm-hmm. started every sentence for the next 10 years with, actually, uh, when I was in Paris, much to the annoyance of everybody around him. Mm-hmm. Th- Only in pa- baguettes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't know what a baguette is? I'll explain what a baguette is, actually, because uh, I ate quite a lot when I was in Paris. Uh, yeah, Paris is very much the coast of of 12th century Europe there, as far as gap years goes. Uh, anyway, so this guy's quite... He's actually born into a wealthy family. He can afford to do this stuff. Uh, how do you feel about dating uh, posh boys, Kath? It's not for me, I'll be honest. It's a bit of a turn-off. Interesting. Um, yeah, because I think that your experience of the world is quite different, isn't it? Yeah, because I like to think, you know, we could approach romance in a classless way. But I actually think in practice it's quite hard because you tend to gravitate towards people who have similar interests to you. And, you know, I have no class prejudice, but but I would be lying if I said I dated many people who were not middle class like me. In fact... In my Tinder year, I was on Tinder for a year, and I went on about two dozen dates over that time, or two dozen women uh, on dates with. And honestly, I think only one of them was probably working class, which may- makes me sound like a bellend, but it wasn't like there was a screening process. It just <laughs> feels like who you gravitate towards. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, exactly. And I accidentally uh, went on a date with somebody who was uh quite well to do but he was northern so i assumed he wouldn't be and that's a classic mistake never make that mistake and uh we had no reference points at all in common and it was um it was it was awkward well that's the thing the the one working class person i dated and this is will not be true of all working class people of course but one of the reasons it didn't go well was i said i don't drink and then because at the time I wasn't drinking, and then at every single moment of quiet throughout the date, she would just say, I can't believe you don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yep, I don't drink. And uh, I don't know, it's just strange. But, I know. thought you weren't going to bring the time we went on a date up, Eden, but I so soon <laughs> into the first episode. <laughs> I'm still bitter about it. Why can't you get your head around my teetotalness, Kath? I just can't believe it. <laughs> I just can't believe it. Uh, so Thomas has come back 
from Paris. He's wearing a striped shirt, a beret. He's got a garland of garlic and onions around his neck. It's and he's beginning just pissed, to smell. Yeah, and he's just pissing everybody off with his talk of Paris. But uh-huh. there's a plot twist. Oh you, Kath, are not into rich boys, but that might be okay because at this point, mm-hmm. his dad becomes skint. He loses all his money. And yes. Tom, young Tom, has to get a job as a clerk. So actually... He's sort of come down a class. He's just got to get a job like everyone else, which is quite humbling, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what I want to happen to all of the rich people. Yeah, just be, brought down a, just be brought down a peg or two. Yeah. And also, like, cause I think we all know that person who never had to get a job. And then they go out from, you know, they, they finish their master's and they're like 23 and have absolutely no employment experience at all. Who is going to hire someone at like in their early 20s? who has never had a job before. Your dad's friends, that's who. Which mm. brings us on to the next thing. His dad, Gilbert, may have been poor, but he did. St- he was able to still open some doors, and he got uh, Tom a job working for Theobald of Beck, who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury. According to the British Museum, Beckett was described by his contemporaries as intelligent, charming, and authoritative. Uh, through his work with the Archbishop, he rose through the ecclesiastical ranks and ended up being recommended by Theobald for the vacant post of Lord Chancellor uh, in 1155 by King Henry II, great grandson of Billy the Conqueror and husband of, get this, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Oh my God, Ellie. Ellie. Now, Eleanor of Aquitaine, I don't know much about beyond her being the wife of King Henry II, but I will say this. That is a fit name. It really is. Ellie it's, Aqua, that would be my stage name. Yeah, exactly. You'd definitely be, if your Twitter avatar would be Ellie Aqua 90 or something. Mm. But just, if you said, Aiden, I want to set you up with someone, she's called Eleanor of Aquitaine, I'd be stiff as a board right off the bat. I wouldn't even <laughs> need to see an image of her. I'd be like, that name oh. is so hot. Mm, and it sounds like she'll be maybe doing like a burlesque act where she gets <laughs> uh, trapped in a in a vat in a big old tank of water, uh, yes. in like in a in a very revealing leather bikini. Yes. Uh, and then you'd be like, "Oh my god, she's drowning!" And and she isn't. She just comes out beautiful and and sexy. And I'm in. Well, her, I choose that one. <laughs> well, we have not decided whether uh, we're going to bang Beckett yet, but we've clearly okay, both I'm decided. So sorry, we've both decided on very little information that we would both bang Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yeah, cool. I'm going to Google her now and see if I can find a picture of her. She, oh, well, I've already done this. She, she is quite hot, actually. Is she? Oh, my yeah. God. How do you spell Eleanor? Is you it... can play along at home, people. Google Eleanor, <laughs> Eleanor of Aquitaine. You are not going to believe this, right? The top three things that came up, we've got Eleanor Tomlinson actress second one eleanor of aquitaine if she knew back in the 12th century that her legacy would be second on google searches she'd have died happy according to the british museum beckett embraced life in the royal court he is said by his contemporary biographers to have enjoyed vast wealth throwing lavish parties decorating his residence with beautiful furnishings and making numerous journeys to france on his own ships uh, according to lawliberty.org, his old friend John of Salisbury said, having gone from middle-class Londoner to Henry's Chancellor, Guy relates that Beckett was eager to convince the aristocrats around him that he belonged. His consumption was conspicuous, even acquiring a travelling zoo to entertain guests. Wow. Are you into this uh, flamboyant display of wealth? It reminds me, actually, of... Did you watch The Tinder Swindler? Yeah. Because that was clearly a lot of women were getting sucked into the sort of you know, that high-flying lifestyle. It feels yeah. like Beckett's sort of playing that card a little bit here. Mm, it's a little bit garish, isn't it? And I think I would enjoy vast wealth as well. But I'm just interested. I wonder what a travelling zoo would have been at those times because it's guaranteed not what we would think of as a zoo. Right? That's a good point because I did imagine a modern zoo. But actually, if you think about travel limitations of the time and the sort of size of the Western world... We could just be talking a sheep, a cow, and a dog. Yeah. Behold, the magnificent piggy on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you show, so you show up on a date. He's there with his like fake sword through his head. And uh-huh. he goes, I've got a zoo. And he just points to some farmyard animals. This yeah. feels like this date isn't going well. Yeah, but it's, that's, a, that's a parakeet, pal. Look yeah. at its beautiful plumage. <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) I will say, there's lots of twists in his life. He started poor, his dad lost the money, he became middle class, or I guess that didn't exist back then, but he had to get a job. Very into showing off all of his stuff, all of his Mm. wealth. 
But halfway through his life, he gets into asceticism. And this is, uh, according to Wikipedia, a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures. Various individuals have also attempted an ascetic lifestyle to free themselves from addictions, some of them particular to modern life, such as alcohol, tobacco, drugs, entertainment, sex, and food. So he actually does sort of become fairly humble. He goes, he... no, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing life wrong. I need to quit the sex, quit the fags. And... Yeah. Uh, be teetotal. I need to be yeah. Aiden. That's what he wants to be. <laughs> he Mary Condors his life. Exactly. So that's what happens. Anyway, Henry II, he wants to exercise greater authority over the church as well as the state. And he appoints Thomas, both Chancellor and Archbishop of Canterbury. That's two jobs in one. Kath, how do you feel about workaholics? Is that a red flag? I don't know. I mean, I think as, as comedians, we're no stranger to the two jobs in one. I don't think I've ever just had one job. Um, so, you know, good on the lad for the hustle. Um, but they both sound like jobs that you you could just do one of them and have enough, right? Well, the Chancellor, I looked into this. The main thing the Chancellor at the time has to do is look after the sort of wax seal mm. that they use to pass laws. <laughs> one wax seal. Yeah, it's not like you're looking after loads. It just feels like pop that in your pocket, get on with your job being the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's true. Yeah. What, do, what does an archbishop do? The current archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the Church of England. At the time, it's actually uh, part of the Catholic Church because the Church of England mm. has not been established yet. Essentially representing the church in England. The archbishop of Canterbury was the one who had to crown the king and stuff like that. Oh, of course. So it's like, here is the wax seal, here is the crown. You could just keep hold of those, friends. Yes. Uh, they were also responsible for, like, uh, collecting all the monies that were owed to the king. So, effectively, like, a tax collector as well. Oh, OK. So, he's like a bailiff. Exactly. Henry tried to pass a set of laws called the Constitutions of Clarendon. Mm -hmm. Then these laws were designed to bring clergymen subject to the king's law rather than church law. So, this is a weird quirk of the time. If you were part of the clergy and you murdered someone, you were defrocked. And that was mm -hmm. it. Whereas, if you weren't a member of the clergy... Uh, you then subject to the king's law and you got, like, murdered and stuff. And Henry wanted to unify this and bring them under the king's law. Yeah, I so, mean, that is fair. I'm, it is, I support that. Well, I thought I did, but then when I thought about it, I thought, well, hang on, that means I support state executions, which I don't. <laughs> so, weirdly, defrocking a priest is closer to my moral worldview than... But that, but that also feels way too light. <laughs> Give us that oh. dog collar back. I cannot believe you killed someone. That feels too light for murder. All I can think of is getting defrocked. It's like getting debagged. So just having them on that, like, the podium, you know, like, they're going to get hung, but instead a guy in a hood just pulls their pants down. Yeah. <laughs> it's too, yeah, it's no. too light. Oh, dear, I've been decagged. And now mm. everyone can see my cock and balls. Oh, damn, I would <laughs> definitely won't kill again. This you was better. absolutely humiliating. No, I think no, I think I am on the king's side here, although I don't think you should kill people for murder. No, but I think that's uh, yeah, a separate yeah. thing. I, think, I don't think that... Because, I mean, we've all seen what happens when you allow uh, men in positions of power in the church to just do as they will. Um, exactly. So I think that, you know, it should be equal. But just because it's equal, perhaps we shouldn't be murdering everybody. Beckett wouldn't let him do it. He was like, no, I'm not allowing you to pass these laws. And this pissed off Henry II, who summoned Tom, ordered him to forfeit all of his property. That's his zoo gone. No. Straight off the bat. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, give me that dog sheep and that cow. You cannot be trusted with this. For God's sake. Can you imagine the king um, just trying to work out how to look after a monkey. Why yeah, did I exactly. take his property from him? <laughs> There's a real sitcom in this, isn't there, Cash? <laughs> Just Henry II, like, in the period directly after he's, he's taken all of Thomas Beckett's property, just being like, why the fuck is there a zoo in my court? <laughs> and why is that zoo a shit zoo? <laughs> Trying to get a tiger off his throne. Please, yes. I need to sit down. Well, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't even be a tiger. It'd just be, like, something rubbish, like an alpaca. <laughs> like, come on. 
Henry, uh, Tom fled to France. Henry II had his son, Henry the Young King, crowned by Becket's enemy, the Archbishop of York. Now, uh, the Archbishop of York and the Archbishop of Canterbury were very much enemies at the time. It was the East Coast, West Coast of the High Middle Ages. <laughs> you know, it was a two-pack biggie of 12th century England. You know, there was drive-by shootings, but they were on horseback and used swords. There was diss tracks, but they were sermons, not actual tracks. They had unauthorised samples of each other's hymns. Awful business. <laughs> also, Henry's son was called Henry the Young King. Mm -hmm. Quite, quite rubbish, isn't it? It is, because you'd think you'd go for the obvious one, wouldn't you? Henry the Third. Unless that was like too much of an imposition on the fact that he was already ruling, because Henry the Young King was the only king that was at this time who was crowned while his, uh, while his dad was still alive and being the king, so... I guess that's why the distinction was made. But it's still a rubbish name. It's like if you were named after your dad or mum in this naming format, what would your name be, Kath? Mm, I would be, uh, I guess, Catherine the Young Sign Writer. <laughs> what kind of signs? Whatever kind of sign you want making. Or like stop. I guess he could make you a stop sign if you want. One time we had some builders. I lived in a basement flat and we had some builders working on the house upstairs. And uh, they kept pissing into, you know, uh, two litre bottles. Um, yeah. they, they'd piss into them because there were no toilet facilities available. And I guess they did have to go somewhere. But um, they, so I've not really got a problem with that. But then they would leave two litres of builder piss outside of our house. So um, I got my dad to make a, a sign of a man pissing <laughs> with a big line through it and put it in the kitchen window. And um, I'll be honest, they still did, but I made an no effort. No respect for signs. No. <laughs> no respect for signs. And therefore, no respect for your dad's legacy. No. Absolutely appalling. Yeah, so there's this Henry the Young King. Uh, presumably, he's like a work experience king, just like making tea, Frank and Mail, doing all the stuff no one, the actual king doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. This pisses off Beckett because he should have been the one to crown it. Um, Beckett asks the Pope to have a word with Henry. Henry agrees to restore Tom Wright as the Archbishop of Canterbury again. And this is where it all kicks off, because basically Henry says out loud, and that, well, this is according to a Beckett bi biographer, the actual words are disputed, but what happened as a result of the words are absolutely not. Henry said something along the lines of, what miserable drones and traitors have I nurtured and promoted in my household who let their lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a low-born clerk? Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? I'm the king. Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? What happened next? And this, you might be familiar with this, because I was sort of, when I heard this, I was sort of vaguely familiar with it. Four knights heard him say this and went, we'll deal with this. <laughs> Your wishes are command. <laughs> exactly. But they, I don't think they told the king they were going to do it. They just went, we're knights. This is this is what we do. They went to Canterbury where uh, Tom was and they had a bit of skirmish and they chopped off the crown off Tom's head. Oh. As in the crown of his head, not he was yours and the crown. <laughs> they chopped his crown off. Oh my God. That And that's why he's got the old knife through his head in the uh, in his Tinder profile, in his, his e trothed profile <laughs> pick -off. Well, that makes sense. But also, can you imagine if he was just wandering around in the king's crown? <laughs> I don't see why this would annoy anyone. It looks great on me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As if he hadn't pissed him off enough. It's like, are you wearing my shit? Mm. <laughs> Give me my shit back. Hey, and are they no. my trainers? <laughs> So I think as well my issue with this is, first of all, why did he keep fucking off to France if he wanted shit here? Second, what kind of arsehole just goes running off to the Pope all the time? And also, as a Pope, why would you, you just be like, one, who are you? Two, <laughs> go away. Just fucking deal with it. Like, why are you bringing this shit to my door? Well, the Pope, the po he's the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he's sort of his main man in uh, in 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 the uh, British Isles, isn't he? So, but there are loads of people that are Catholic at this time, no doubt. So, can you yeah. imagine trying to keep hold of, like, keep track of all the beef? Just trying to keep track of who's fallen out with who. Take your Jeremy Kyle disagreement <laughs> and fuck off. Is what well, I would say as the Pope. This is, well, this is why you're probably going to be the next Pope, Cap, because that's exactly <laughs> the kind of attitude that they're looking for to replace Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the thing. This wasn't a Jeremy Kyle style like dispute. This was like th 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 there was a thing at the time called like I think it was called the Gregorian Revolution, and it was based around 
uh, the church wanting a certain amount of powers for itself. And this whole episode of the king wanting to, like, you know, shut down the power of the church and get more power for himself in legal matters is all part of the same thing. Mm. And, and this is sort of why the king was like, why will they, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? Mm. Because he was like, I'm supposed to be the king. And I've got to, like, you know, dance for this bloody priest. It's annoying him, isn't it? He says, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? They go off and do it. And, you know, you've got to be careful with your wording, haven't you? It's like with a work email. You know, you got to read it back before you hit send. Yeah. you got to think before you speak, you know. If you don't do that, before you know it, you're emailing your work saying, who wants to have some work dicks instead of work drinks? And then you're just the laughing stock of the office. Yeah. And that's what happened here. He said something, people took it literally, and someone died. And um, suddenly there's the, a load of dicks in his court. And he's like, oh, yeah, what? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, where am I? Am I in Pompeii again? <laughs> exactly. He was murdered, and there was, like, blood all over the altar where he was murdered. And after his death, an extraordinary wave of miracles was recorded in and around the site, all across the globe, people seeing images of Thomas Beckett. And it meant that the, the Pope canonised him, made him a saint, uh, a mere three years after his death. Beckett's reputation as a miracle-working saint spread quickly, and people from all over Europe started to flock to Canterbury in the hope that they would be healed. As well as visiting the tomb, pilgrims could also purchase a mixture of his blood and water called St. Thomas's Water, which was bottled and sold by opportunistic monks in small lead vessels called Ampula. Henry II, in a public act of penance for his involvement in the murder, visited the tomb in 74, granting royal approval to Beckett's cult. So what I like about this is, have you ever been to a Catholic apparition site, Kath? I, I can't say that I have, actually. I don't know. <laughs> I've not been to one. I've been to two. Wow. I've been to Lewis, and I've been to this other one that I can't remember the name of in uh, the Balkans. Mm -hmm. So what happens is some teenage girl usually will go, oh, I saw the Virgin Mary, and then it becomes this pilgrimage site. Mm -hmm. and what they, they, The other thing they have in common is they're full of tat, just cheap plastic tat based like you can buy like virgin mary lighters you know what i mean <laughs> you can buy my friend genuinely when he was 15 bought for his dad a knife a bread knife in which the handle was the virgin mary oh and which his dad threw out when he gave it to him because <laughs> it was awful <laughs> And uh, I kind of I kind of like that that's sort of happening already here. They're selling these bottled St. Thomas's water. They've probably got pen knives with, uh, Tom, with where the knife is the knife going through Thomas's head. Yeah. They've all got all that stuff going on back then. It is, and I just think it's insane whether you've got ill people turning up being like, please cure me, every day of my life is pain. Here, don't worry, drink a stranger's blood out of this lead bottle. <laughs> don't they know about AIDS? God. <laughs> He remained a cult hero for 300 years until Henry VIII decided that he was a prick, destroyed his shrine and tried to wipe him from history, mm -hmm. which is actually a proper cancellation. He's like, mm. if Beckett was alive at the time, he'd no doubt uh, he would have had a Netflix special like that. He would have immediately. Exactly. Really hack one. I mean, I would argue that, you know, his death was probably the, the main cancellation. It, death is the ultimate cancellation, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I think that you can't, claim to be cancelled unless somebody has gone into your workplace and cut the top of your head off in which exactly. case fair fucks you've been cancelled otherwise shut up yeah shut up gervais <laughs> you ain't got a knife in your head you're doing all right um the news of beckett's miracle spread like wildfire um According to HistoricUK.com, Brother William and Prior Benedict, two monks, were appointed to keep a book which documented the miracles that took place while the visitors were at Thomas Beckett's tomb. Two questions. How many miracles do you think have to be recorded in your name for the Catholic Church to make you a saint? See, my initial guess would be really high, but actually... I reckon it's, it's a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle, right? So I, I yeah. think one would be enough. Two. Two. Oh, okay, because one I, could be a fluke, two proves you can yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like uh, you don't make someone the team captain in, in football just based on one goal. Yeah, it could be a beginner's look, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. second goal, you can be captain. Two, Catholic is how many you need to become a saint. How many do you think were recorded as happening in relation to Beckett's death? Jeez. Um, four. 703. Oh, my God. So, because you said that they were worldwide as well, right? People would go there for miracles, but but I think people were seeing him all over the world. But what, did those people know who he was? <laughs> just... Yeah, because it just... Well, it's interesting. Well, that's a good oh, point. was he like, I am... Um, and please tell the Pope that uh, this, Tom <laughs> Thomas 
to- yeah, T H O yeah. Thomas Be- Beckett. No, you didn't have to do that, Kath. Why? <laughs> What's the distinguishing feature he has? That means people just know when they see him. Was he wearing a t shirt oh, with his name? <laughs> <laughs> Better than that. Did he have a dagger in his head? He had a dagger in his head. Oh. So that's how they know. It's like, oh, who could that be? Uh, it's zany Tom and his bloody <laughs> plastic sword hair. That's what he wears on dates. I'm going to list six miracles. Three of them are actual miracles attributed to the shrine of Thomas Beckett, and three mm-hmm. I've made up. Okay. And you, Kath, have to tell me which ones I've made up. Oh, my God, perfect. Okay, let's go. One, the curing of leprosy. I'm going to say that's real. Correct. Two, the sudden duplication of a nearby cow. Uh, I'm going to say yeah as well, because there could just have been two cows, but one could have been behind a tree. Exactly. And it also could have been from his uh, shit zoo that he used to have. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, it's fake. I made that up. Nah. Uh, the curing of blindness. I mean, yeah, that's got to be true, right? Obviously. Uh, the Virgin Mary appeared drunk and slurred. Sorry, wrong up as his parishion site. Uh, I am going to say that that one's false. Yeah, that sounds like I made it up, and I did. Uh, <laughs> the curing of paralysis. True. Yep. And uh, Christ appeared shortly after the appearance of Mary and said, has anyone seen my mum? I must say false. False. Yeah. <laughs> you did all right there. You, you got the sudden duplication wrong. But apart from that, pretty good. Mm-hmm. BBC Bite Sides have a fun graphic charting the relationship of Henry II and Beckett. It's like a bar graph that dips when they're enemies and then <laughs> rises when they're friends. <laughs> It's quite fun. I've actually set one up for our friendship cast. Yeah. And it's currently it's currently quite high because we're both excited about this podcast. Mm-hmm. But when one of us gets more successful than the other and moves to America to present a late night chat show, it's going to dip into enemies. Yeah. And uh, and I'm very much looking forward to that period. Oh, it's Even though it'll fair. probably be you that does the chat show. But anyway. <laughs> Historical hot or not. Where are you at? Uh, we have the Bayo Tap Vatistry which we're going to embroider. All the people in history we decide are bangworthy mm-hmm. are going to get embroidered onto this thing, and then it'll be put up in a museum in northern France for people to look at for centuries. Mm-hmm. So is the first person on the Bayeux Tap Vatistry, is it going to be Thomas Beckett Cath? What do you think? Well, first of all, I absolutely love your pun that you've come up with. Uh, it's my favourite thing about this podcast. Can you tell the... Uh, Comedy promoters, though. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so I could do with a bit more live work, but go on. <laughs> so I'll be honest with you. Um, from looking at his picture, it was a no. But, you know, it, a photograph of painting, it's not a 3D uh, view of a person, exactly. is it? So, I, you know, I always think it's a bit unfair to just judge someone from a picture. Because sexual attraction is not just physical. We mm. do make an initial judgment on these apps. But it's not like if they're just fit, that's going to lead to something. You don't have to assess the personality. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, the, there's different things like their, their gait or their smell or their, you know, their, their confidence, the way they hold themselves, their personality. Well, it, it was your smell that when we went on that day, <laughs> Kath, was the reason it, it didn't go any further. I shouldn't have worn that fish perfume, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you exactly. live and learn. And I know you think it was the you going, oh, you can't leave me no drink. But no, it was the stench, <laughs> the absolute stench of the woman. <laughs> I should have showered. Learning about his life, um, he didn't redeem himself to me at all. I assumed that he would be a better person, foolishly, uh, because he was a part of the church. But actually, the church has time and time again proven that they're not. They're not always good. He ran away when the going got tough. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't keep his mouth shut at the right times. I feel like they're two very big qualities that you want in a person. Are you not attracted to his, I'm going to stand up for this king who selfishly wants us? Is that not hot? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, standing up for what you believe in is hot. However, uh, it was in self-interest because it's like, oh, I don't want to have to obey by the rules that everybody else does. Uh, if it was like, I'm going to stand up against the king and get him to stop killing children to sport, <laughs> then I'd be like, you know what, fair fucks, pal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was like, I want special treatment. Fuck off. Good, good shout. And also there's a sort of, the dichotomy, I think, in terms of, say, if I was choosing whether I'd bang Beckett, mm-hmm. He's like quite ostentatious in showing off his wealth and stuff, yeah. his shit zoo, all that kind of thing. 
And then actually, when he realizes that's bad, he goes way too much of the way and becomes a full teetotaler ascetic. So actually, at the point you're like, oh, maybe I would bang this guy. Actually, he's like, I don't want to bang you mm-hmm. because I'm, I'm not into that shit anymore. So it's like, you can't win with the guy. No, he, he, I guess that's right, isn't he? He overcorrects. Exactly. It's like if you tell a ch- child to be quiet and then it doesn't, they don't speak for tw- like a day to make mm-hmm. a point. So you're like, no, you've overcorrected now. Exactly. Stop being so. Yeah. Do you want fish fingers or chicken nuggets for tea? Exactly. And if and if there's anyone I absolutely will not have sex with, it's children. I've always said that. <laughs> always As said a rule. That. And I want it on record on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fair. I think that goes for both of us. Well, you said you'd date an 18 year old before. Uh, well, um, so when I was 18. You've, you've already revealed yourself. <laughs> Would you tap him? No, for the aforementioned reason. I think at the point he becomes attractive, he does not want to bang you. Mm -hmm. And again, there's nothing more unattractive than a lack of consent, is there? At least as far as Mm -hmm. I go. So I on balance quite like him, but I don't think I'd bang him. So the Bayo tap that history will remain vacant for another week. It will. We're off to go and drink uh, each other's blood out of uh, lead-lined vessels. Yep, we've had a blood test. We haven't got mm-hmm. AIDS, so we're well, clear one of us front. hasn't. Um, so... <laughs> what? Wow. Okay. No. Can we cut <laughs> by process of elimination? That means can we cut it out where I wrongly <laughs> told <laughs> the world that I've got a blood bond illness because I haven't. No. We'll leave okay. It fair enough. Uh, thanks for listening to Historical <laughs> Hot or Not. It went very weird at the end there. Arguably the whole thing's a bit weird, but hey, we're, mm. we're owning it. Goodbye, and tune in next week where Kath is going to propose to me a historical <laughs> figure, and I'll decide whether I want to bang him or not. Do you want to say yeah, bye, Kath? Uh, as, as Thomas Beckett would say, au revoir. Kath, let's go down to the chemist and get those uh, retrovirals. <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening to Historical Hot or Not. If you'd like to contribute, we would fucking love that. So you can find us, we're at Coffee, buy us a coffee. Uh, don't send it to us personally, it'll be cold by then. Uh, but it's co b.com forward slash hot not pod. Uh, send us some coffee, not real coffee, send us the money for coffee. Episodes written by Aidan McCaffrey and Catherine Mather. Our wonderful logo is by Richard Todd. And all music by David Eagle.